Welcome back. I'm curious, how many of you are actual Biola students, uh, graduate students or undergraduate students? Hey, terrific. And how many of you are uh, pastors? Terrific. Good to see you all here. For how many of you, is this your first time at Biola University? Oh, dynamite. Well, our reach is extending, you know, keep the word up. By the way, if you want to know more about what we're doing, make sure you uh, just drop your email address off at the uh, book table or the registration table, and we can uh, make sure you get informed of these kinds of things. Well, hope you enjoyed lunch. Glad to have you right back here, and I think you'll enjoy what we have next. We're going to hear a little bit from uh, Marvin Olasky who is the editor-in-chief of World Magazine and the provost of King's College in New York City and the author of over 20 books and so on. And he has a great interest in this topic. In fact, I read your article recently on your little Grand Canyon trip. I thought that was really fun. Oh, so we'll hear from Dr. Olasky, and then we will hear from our panel as uh, Marvin roughs them up good. And they rough each other up good. All right? All right. Well, enjoy this. Dr. Olasky. Well, thank you. No, I'm excited to see so many people here on a Saturday here in Southern California. Uh, I got up at uh, 12.30 this morning, California time. I was in the East in Charlotte. I couldn't come. Uh, I had a conference to speak at last night, but I wanted to get here. Wild horses could have kept me away, but not much else, because this is the, this is the most important issue, I think, right now. World, as those of you who have read it are maybe familiar, it's, we're really not a theological journal at all. We don't want to get into internecine warfare among Christians, but this is one where we have to be involved because this is the issue. It involves, as John West and others have pointed out, it influences everything else that goes on, including even the decriminalizing marijuana provision that we're watching carefully here in California. Um, when I was flying this morning, I was reading a, a book on, on the uh, question of creation evolution, and the fellow who was sitting next to me asked, well, are you a theologian? Are you a scientist? And of course, I could, from my position of ignorance, I could happily say, well, neither. I'm a journalist and a professor, and, and I don't really know this stuff, but I do have a sense of where the public is going. And what I found fascinating is that, is that on a public level, on a big societal level, the debate is really not at all between followers of the Bible and Darwinistic materialists. I mean, it's there. But maybe, and I've been looking at public opinion polls, maybe 10% of the American population will actually subscribe to Darwinistic materialism. The bulk of the population is divided between biblical approaches and theistic evolution. And I could just give you some, some poll figures. The, uh, uh, this is the, the, here's the way in a Gallup poll, uh, would people agree with this pr proposal? God created human beings pretty much in their present form at one time within the last 10,000 years or so. So that even leaves out the older Earth folks. This is, these are young Earth creationists, and 44 to 47% of the American public, in poll after poll, year after year, have been affirming that. Then another question was asked, uh, do you agree that human beings have developed over millions of years from less advanced forms of life, but God guided the process? And again, sometimes changes, but pretty consistently over the years, about 35 to 38 percent of people saying that. And then as far as the, the third provision, again, these are the only three alternatives offered in the series of Gallup polls. Quote, human beings have developed over millions of years from less advanced forms of life, but God had no part in the process. Again, 9 to 14 percent. So that's not really a big figure as far as the American public is concerned. The real battle is between followers of, of a biblical approach, whether young earth or old earth creationists, or theistic evolutionists who pretty much don't go along with what the Bible says, or at least that's my reading of it. And what I've learned from, from reading this, and, and it's a terrific book, God and Evolution, you have, the, uh, you have it all now, I hope you'll read it. I was able to read it in proofs uh, since I, was, I missed the first part of today. I've, I've read it all, and assuming the speakers early this morning were following pretty much what they're saying in the book, there were three big ideas that I derived from the book, along with lots of other interesting information. And the three big ideas, what we learn about God, what we learn about, well, I'll, I'll use this, this five-letter word, what we learn about Satan, and what we learn about the strategies that Darwinists use. And first, this is what jumped out at me, what we learn about God. 
uh, really starts with Genesis 127. God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him. And whatever the length of the six days of creation, they do give us a sense of what it means to be created in God's image. Again, we know God could have created everything at once by saying one word or no words at all. He didn't do that. He did things sequentially over six days, then he rested per day. And some speculate that we're living in the seventh day, but I, I think not. If God worked six days and then retired permanently, he would not be much of a model for us. If we were a deistic God and we're made in his image, we'd work one moment and then we'd go on perpetual vacation. That's not who we are. G.K. Chesterton's quip quoted in the, in the book that evolution does not especially deny the existence of God. What it does deny is the existence of man. And basic to that existence is our creation in God's image. So we work. We worked in a perfect environment before the fall. Adam worked then. Afterwards, we, Adam and all of us work amid thorns and thistles, but we always work. And therefore, God always works. I mean, God, Jesus said that. God did not create everything at once. So Jay Richards, in, in one of his chapters, notes that some say it's beneath God's dignity to be involved in the world, instead of being made merely the divine watchmaker now on vacation. Or Francis Collins, he's quoted in this book, as saying that I.D. portrays the Almighty as a clumsy creator, having to intervene at regular intervals to fix the inadequacies of his own initial plan. But Jay writes, maybe he desires a world that's more like a violin than a self-winding watch. Maybe he wants a world that exhibits a certain predictable regularity but is no, by no means close to his direct influence. Maybe God is like a hobbyist who enjoys having a work in progress. And that tells us something about God. It also tells us something about man as we're created in his image. David Klinghoffer in his articles was summarizing such thoughts by asking why God tinkers, whether by performing a miracle or shaping a species. And, and David notes a rabbi from almost a millennium ago Bakke ibn Kabakuda, who, who explains that if things were smooth, it would seem that natural law, not God, was the fount of creativity. So God apparently enjoys doing things in sudden bursts. God displays his own freedom as a moral example to us, so we are created in his image. So we learn a lot about God by the way in which he created things. And I'm very thankful for Jay and David and others for bringing that out. But secondly, we also learn about the opposition to God, and particularly we learn about Satan. Uh, Denise O'Leary, not, not in her talk, but in her, in her chapter, was asking, well, she mentioned that in her talk also, why Darwinian theory, with all the reservations many scientists have about it, has so much staying power. And she gets abusive mail from Darwinists, I suspect a lot of us have. And why? Why doesn't the lack of serious evidence make a difference? Or, to quote Denise, what, non, what non-scientific function is Darwinism serving in society today? And we can come up with all kinds of sociological reasons, but there's one analytical tool I learned, I'm embarrassed to admit this, but I might as well. Back uh, in my early 20s, I was actually a member of the Communist Party. So this is almost four decades ago, but there are a few things that have stuck with me. Hopefully I've forgotten a lot of it. But uh, Vladimir Lenin used to ask the question, comes out very nicely in Russian, Katokova, which means who whom, essentially. Who benefits from a particular idea or action? Who comes under attack? And so let's do Katokova in, re- in relation to theistic evolution. Uh, John West summarizes Carl Guyberson's belief that, quote, so long as people accept the divinity of Jesus, their view of God as creator is unimportant, end quote. Oh, really? John also summarizes Guyberson's view that, quote, human beings were sinful and flawed from their inception, end quote. Therefore, Adam and Eve did not fall, but Guyberson says the fall is inconsequential for our need for our salvation. Oh, really? Without the fall from what are we being saved? Uh, University of Wisconsin historian of science, Ron Numbers, quoted in this book, uh, a believer in Christianity until he became a Darwinist knows the score. Quote, with evolution, you don't start out with anything perfect. There's no perfect state from which to fall. This makes the whole plan of salvation silly because there never was a fall. And John West writes in his essay, without God as creator, the rest of the Christian story makes very little sense. And he quotes others, so, could talk of uh, who whom? Genesis 3.15, he shall bruise your heel, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So every time someone sneers at creation and thus doesn't understand our need for redemption, if you, st- if you sneer at creation, if you sneer at the fall, then you don't really need redemption. There's no original sin, you don't need to be saved in that way. Every single time someone sneers in that way, Satan, that old serpent, bites our heel. Every time someone grasps 
the wonder of creation and the terror of sin and how it emerged and then confesses his need for Christ. The serpent's head is bruised, one day to be crushed. What should give good cheer to all the authors here and many of you in the audience is that your heel and your heel and your heel and their heels are being bruised. If we don't get bruised, we're wasting our lives. So we learn something from this book about the nature of God, the nature of Satan. When we're bruised, we should rejoice. We are worthy of being bruised, and we can only bruise if we're willing to be bruised. So why is Darwinism and Energizer Bunny going and going and going, seen as a holy theory by our educational establishment, not just one full of holes? We see in the Bible that God, in fact, is his own light source, bringing light even when there is no sun at the beginning and at the end. We also know that Satan can supply energy when normal batteries would have worn out. So Satan's goal is to make humans doubt God's plan for salvation. And what better way than to deny the fall? And so when we deny creation, when we deny the fall, when we deny the biblical history account, we're also saying there's really no need for Christ, there's no need for redemption. And Satan rejoices every time people say that. So we learn something about God, we learn something about the paramount enemy of God. And we also learn something about strategies. What strategies do evolutionists use? Uh, Jonathan Wells, I think, is, is, is brilliant in noting that uh, uh, there's the Darwin of the gaps. It really turns around the usual uh, charge. And, and, he, and he talked uh, this morning about uh, how Francis Collins loves to talk about junk DNA, but that's actually junk talk. Just not true. And so Darwin of the gaps, uh, Casey Luskin, uh, in his chapter, does a great job of showing what could be called, if, if, if I may coin a phrase, the wedge strategy. It's the wedge strategy of the Darwinians. Uh, from their vantage point, they see that Christians are united against them, but if they can make evolution theistic, they can drive a wedge that will divide Christian from Christian. And will also divide some Jews from other Jews. That's the whole goal. Uh, we see in, in uh, Casey is, is looking at the various, the various folks in this chapter. I recommend highly that you read that as in the other chapters. Uh, Michael Ruse, biology professor, is a self-described ex-Christian. But when asked, can a Darwinian be a Christian, he answers, absolutely. And of course, Francisco Ayala, the former president of the American Association of the Advancement of Science, he's very similar. I mean, he seems to, at various times, have lost whatever faith he had, but he still likes to claim the scarab of a Christian. It's very, very useful. It's a great strategy. Um, Carl Guyberson, Casey writes about Carl Guyberson, Guyberson uh, and this is just a fantastic quotation, that Carl, in the conclusion of Saving Darwin, lists his compelling reasons to believe in God. Here is compelling reasons to believe in God. His parents, his wife, his children, and most of his friends are believers, and he would lose his job at a Christian college, quote, if I were to reject the faith. Abandoning belief in God would be disruptive, sending my life completely off the rails, end quote. Well, yeah, uh, this is a problem. If it's not true, if it's just, well, if, you, if you're saying, claiming it because it's disruptive, or perhaps also because it disrupts other people. It disrupts the biblical defenders of God's work. You know, before the Soviet Union collapsed two decades ago, we had, well, but there were about three decades of people trying to find socialism with a human face. And it turned out this humane socialism was an invisible man didn't exist. And so I suspect that theistic evolution is also a ghost. The real face of evolution is that of, well, the biologist blogger P.Z. PZ, PZ Myers. Myers wants, quote, religion to be reduced to little more than a hobby or a little eccentricity that some people practice. We need widespread social stigmatization of religion to eradicate religion. Um, you know, Casey notes the scorn of the hardliners for the wedgers. Um, but I'm not, saying, I'm not saying the theistic evolutionists are insincere. I suspect a lot of them are, are sincere. They may be sincere, but they're also wrong to think that their activity glorifies God. An expression from, from my old communist days, the communists still use, useful idiots. Uh, many TEs are very smart folks, so we should not call them useful idiots. Maybe we should call them useful idiot savants. Uh, and maybe we shouldn't call them idiots at all. Just leave that out. That's not, that's not polite. So let's just say they are useful savants. 
And since the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, we have some true savants here on stage. But since I'm calling the TEs useful savants, I suppose we here are the useless savants. And I'm suggesting we start a rock band with that name. <laughs> but right now, I'll stop and I'll ask some idiot questions. And then you also will get a chance in a few minutes to ask your questions. But let me just sit down here. <laughs> and, and let me start with, with Jay. Uh, why or why not is it possible to believe in both theistic evolution and intelligent design? I would say as long as you, you specify a meaning of evolution that is compatible with actual intentional purpose of activity, then that's a, a coherent that's a coherent position. Now, what's true is a different question, but I, I chose to sort of uh, frame the debate in logical terms, obviously, in the book. We didn't get into exegetical things and like that, things like that, but, you know, I noticed that the poll that you described, Marvin, there at the beginning, and it's been asked for years, there's, it's basically, the question basically asks, are you a young earth creationist? Uh, do you believe in some second possibility that kind of sounds like theistic evolution, but even that one is quite explicitly teleological evolution. That's not the theistic evolution we're talking about here today. Um, and then that sort of small percentage that would be the sort of straight materialist. And so I, what I've discovered is that most people that aren't, you know, sort of card-carrying theistic evolutionists that say, uh, I believe God used evolution to create us. They, they actually aren't Darwinian. They actually picture God doing something actively for a purpose over a long period of time. I think Phil Johnson called that sort of creation on the installment plan or something like right. that. That's a perfectly coherent position. I think that you, know, you, you, you should take into account important biblical and theological issues and the empirical data. Um, could God have created in a variety of different ways? Of course he could. I think as Robert Boyle said, we want to look to the evidence of nature uh, for certain questions to find out not what God could have done, but what he did in fact do. And so I feel like the position that we have in the book and that a lot of ID people have is let's be open to the evidence of nature. Uh, my own view is that the, the theistic evolutionists, or really the deistic evolutionists, as you were saying at lunch, or the theistic Darwinists, they are trying to square the circle. They're trying to uh, embrace or accommodate a Dar the Darwinian claim, and if you just spend 15 minutes looking at what Darwinism, Darwin meant to do, and what its proponents mean by the theory, it, it's quite clear that the whole point of the theory is to provide a designer substitute, as John West said. And so I, I just think as a simple logical point, I don't, you can't be an Orthodox Darwinist and an Orthodox theist, whether Christian or Jew. Insofar as your view is uh, Darwinian, it will not be theistic, and insofar as it's theistic, it will not be Darwinian. And I think that's just a straightforward logical point that the, the new atheists seem to recognize better than the theistic evolutionists. Denise, it looks like you want to hop in on this. Um, well, I hadn't planned to. Oh, um, you, just, you just had that expectant look <laughs> on, your, on your face. I'm always interested in what people say about these things. Um, I could comment that um, many Christians simply avoid the issues because they're considered divisive. And one result is they don't get clear in their minds what's really being said. Mm -hmm. So the dominant position I hear is, isn't it wonderful that an evangelical Christian is now head of National Institutes of Health? <laughs> well, is it wonderful? Um, we've heard from Jonathan what he actually thinks. Let me just leave you with one point before going on. Collins was clearly wrong about DNA, but notice that that doesn't matter. The, most, the thing I took away from Jonathan's presentation, apart from the valuable information, is that it didn't matter that he was wrong. He's still a Darwinist in good standing. <laughs> now, of course, we can be wrong and say I was wrong and um, <clears throat> start again with a project that didn't work out. Fine. But anything said in defense of Darwin, whether it's truth, untruth, or nonsense, is okay. The important thing is it was said in defense of Darwin. Th that's what I'm taking away from what I'm hearing. Okay. I don't know who agrees with me. We'll see. Well, let me ask a follow-up question. Well, David, you wanted to get in on this? Yeah, I was, I was, I was just going to say, you know, this is certainly true of Christians, but also, but also of Jews. 
that, that on this issue, people often don't think in terms of what's true or what's not true. They think about what kind of a person am I? What sort of sociological background do I fit into? And therefore, based on, or, or, or do I aspire to? And based on that, what should I believe? So when you try to argue with people you're, about the ideas, it's almost like you're, you're speaking past each other. They, they're thinking about, I'm, I want to be this kind of a person. Or, you know, I'm a Jew, I'm not a Christian, therefore if Christians think this, then as a Jew I can't think that because I'm not a Christian, I have to think the, the, the opposite. And the, there's this, this whole mixed up mess of sort of sociological categories and self-esteem that, that is totally, has nothing to do with the scientific issues that, that we're, we, try to, we try to discuss. Right. Let me, let me ask a follow-up question. Maybe I'll, I'll pose this to, to Casey because you did such a good analysis of, of uh, where the theistic evolutionists are coming from. Um, certainly among evangelicals, biblical inerrancy is a, is a, is a core element. Uh, can you be logically both a, a believer in, in biblical inerrancy and a theistic evolutionist? I don't know if I'm the right person to answer that question. My background is in science and law. I'm not a okay. theologian. I, I've read my Bible, but I don't know, claim any more expertise beyond that. Um, it depends on how you read Genesis, I guess. I'm, I don't know if I'm really truly the best person to answer this question. So. Well, let, me, let me ask truly then the best person, John West. <laughs> <laughs> political scientist, I, I would say it depends on what you mean by evolution. And I, okay. For myself, I'll just be honest, as a Christian, I don't actually, I think, and this may be controversial to some people here, but I really don't think that it's productive to look at Genesis 1 and 2 as, I, I, think, they're, I, I think the Bible is true. So I accept that. But I think trying to read them as almost a scientific text, even old earth or young earth, as if it sort of gives you, you know, God's plan of how he actually created things, I think is not the message that's being conveyed. So I do think that you can believe in a type of evolution. I think that one can be a, an Orthodox Christian and believe in universal common descent if you think that God did something unique with human beings. I think the evidence for that <laughs> raises a lot of questions. But if you're trying to square Orthodox Darwinian theory okay. with that, you know, God uh, himself didn't know how things were going to turn out, or that he's some sort of cosmic trickster, I think that is very hard to square with inerrancy or even anything like Orthodox Christianity. Well, let me ask a question then to anyone. In, in Darwinian theory, is there any room for God having had the whole process, the Darwinian process, but he still knew how it was going to turn out? Is it possible, is it possible to do that, or is that a logical impossibility? Well, I can speak to that as far as what textbooks say about Darwinian evolution. One of the things I do in my chapter is spend a lot of time looking at what textbooks say. Um, I think it's an important part of scholarship to just take somebody's word that this is what their position is. And the best place to understand what evolution says is to just go to the textbooks. And textbooks, numerous textbooks are very clear that Darwinian evolution is an unguided, undirected, purposeless process. These are not my words, these are their words. There's even textbooks, mainstream scientific textbooks, the kinds that are used in public schools that say that there was no God involved in this process. So I'm not really the one answering your question. It's the biology textbooks themselves that answer it. Okay. John? There certainly is a, a tradition of theistic evolution that, the, that theists have said that, well, evolution could be guided and God knows that. Most of that happened really at the time of Darwin and the few decades after that. In fact, the co-discoverer of the theory of evolution by natural selection, who was not a Christian but he was a theist, Alfred Wallace, Alfred Russell Wallace, really had an end up falling out with Darwin, this is something you don't learn in the textbooks, over the issue of was evolution you know, guided by an intelligent hand. And what really shows Darwin's heart is that Darwin was just apoplectic when, when Wallace came up, well, no, there's strong evidence in nature, even though we believe natural selection could do some things, especially when it comes to human beings, when it comes to some intricately complicated things in nature that speaks of intelligent design and uh, a higher intelligence. Darwin just was really upset by that. But Wallace, um, Mivart, um, a number, uh, Asa Gray, there certainly were those people uh, at the time who believed in a guided sort of evolution. But what goes by theistic evolution today 
apart from the pews of the people who aren't reading, you know, people want, I think a lot of ordinary Christians think, well, can't you have your Darwin and have this? God could have guided it. But as Jay says, you can believe in that type of evolution, but that's not Darwinism. And what goes by theistic evolution today, if you actually read the people who are writing, whether John Hott at, uh, at uh, uh, Georgetown University or you know, the people who self-identify today, it's not guided evolution. It really is. It's either unguided or you have the halfway house that Francis calls. The best you sort of get is Collins. Well, and Collins himself is hard to pin down because, again, in part of language of God, uh, Jonathan Wells did a good job of... of pointing out his things about junk DNA, and he's actually making an argument that a lot about us was unguided. It was very Darwinian. But then he almost knows on another page, that, oh, this is getting too far, so if you're getting uncomfortable, well, God could have known but made it look unguided. So that's about the best you'll get from modern theistic evolutionists. And I said, that may be better than the full-blown denying that God knows what he's doing, uh, but even that is pretty uh, distant from sort of orthodox, in Christian terms, orthodox, Catholic, and Protestant for the past 2,000 years. Well, let me ask Jonathan, because you're, you're the Francis Collins expert at this point. Oh, no. You've, <laughs> you, you, uh, what, what, what's your sense from having, from having read the language of God and, and studied his work? Um, What's, what's really, what's really dri his, his driving influence? Why, why is he coming? Do you have any sense of why he's coming to the conclusions he's coming to? Honestly, no. Uh, I don't know what motivates the man. I've never met him. Okay. I can only go by what I've read in the book and That's what I'm various asking, other yeah. things. And as John said, uh, he's confused. He's, he's ambiguous in places. What I do know confidently as a biologist is that the evidence he relies on simply isn't true. And so whatever argument he's mounting, uh, he's doing it without scientific backing. Okay. And do you, well, let me, let me throw open to, to all of you the, the, uh, uh, the question that Jay and I were discussing a little bit at lunch. We, we call uh, uh, this whole group of folks theistic evolutionists because that's, the, that's their preferred title. But is that accurate? Should, should we really call them deistic evolutionists, or, or, or is there some other name that would more accurately describe where they really are? You know, it's funny because we've discussed this uh, amongst ourselves. We, we settled on theistic evolution primarily because it's least likely to be seen as a pejorative. If I were to call Carl Guyverson a theistic Darwinist, he knows that I don't like the word Darwinist, and so it would be taken as a pejorative. And the word deistic is also taken as a pejorative. In fact, theistic evolutionists often it pains to insist that, no, we're not Darwinist. In fact, I think uh, that God sustains the universe in being from moment to moment, unlike the deist. Now, it turns out it is this kind of ceremonial role, and you could never, it doesn't actually make any real difference for them to claim that, so they can claim it. Uh, but nevertheless, they clearly deny that God acts within the created order in some kind of detectable way. And so really theistic evolution, it's sort of the default term because it's at least the least offensive to the people that we're trying to criticize. And we don't want to label them with a, uh, with, you know, a pejorative term, but it's kind of a placeholder and it's not really descriptively accurate. I would prefer something like you know, deistic Darwinist or something like that, if it, but that sounds really yeah, nasty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Deist. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, deists at least agreed that God set up things, and so in, in some essence, our nature and creation does reflect God's specific intentions. But according to sort of orthodox theistic evolution, you can't even say that. It really is a, equivalent to the old line Gnosticism, because you, you can't say that anything in sort of biology reflects God's specific intentions, because he delegated to someone else, or an impersonal process. Mm -hmm. when, do we get uh, the Galileo trial thrown at us a lot? Oh, yeah. uh, and, and, and how do you respond to that when, when people try to make the comparison Absolutely. then and now? I mean, it's funny, but, and I dealt with this Guillermo Gonzalez and I a bit in The Privileged Planet, but I've become more and more convinced that this sort of historical episodes are absolutely crucial to the scientific materialist claim. And the, the basic claim is that, well, sometime in the Middle Ages there was this sort of oppressive religion, but over a, a period of centuries, science eventually liberated us from religion uh, into the you know, sort of light of day, finally, in the 19th or 20th centuries. And to say that requires all these stories, and not one of them is really true or accurately presented. So you get the Galileo story uh, and his interactions with the church. Now it was a complicated story. No one sort of comes off 
looking good, either Galileo or the church or the pope at the time. But it's very complicated. Galileo was, first of all, wrong about a lot of stuff. His arguments were bad in many cases. He was quite obnoxious, and he uh, intentionally mocked the pope at the time, who had been actually a sort of supporter and benefactor. Uh, it's a really bad episode if you're trying to prove that science and religion are tr intrinsically at war. The famous Scopes Monkey Trial, of course, anybody that looks into that, we know that most of the things we're told about it are not true. Uh, in, in Britain, it's the, the Bishop Wilberforce Thomas Henry Huxley debate, which took place just a year after The Origin of Species was published. And every, anyone that's heard of this heard that at some point Wilberforce asked Huxley, is it through your grandfather or your grandmother that you're descended from an ape? And Huxley supposedly comes back with a retort that sort of silences Wilberforce. Uh, it didn't happen. It's, uh, the story that was told about that happened about 30 years after the fact. Uh, in fact, uh, Wilberforce focused very specifically on the empirical arguments against Darwinism. I could go on like this for 45 minutes. Almost every story you've heard about the, the supposed warfare between religion or Christianity and science uh, is either false or, or deeply distorted. But those historical narratives, I think, are as important for maintaining scientific materialism as any of the supposedly scientific arguments. It's really important that we inoculate ourselves against it. Jonathan? Uh, to uh, underscore that, the so-called warfare metaphor, which is well known among historians of uh, science, uh, really pretty much didn't exist before Darwin. Mm -hmm. uh, it got its uh, impetus from two books written after Darwin by supporters of Darwinian evolution, mm -hmm. John Draper and Andrew Dixon White. Andrew Dixon White, by the way, was one of the founders of Cornell University. Right. Uh, but they both wrote books uh, promoting this warfare metaphor and making up this story about how religion had impeded the progress of science for centuries until finally Darwin liberated us. Well, actually, Darwin started the war. All right. We're going to go to questions from the audience in just a moment. There are uh, um, uh, mics set up in, in these two aisles on either side. But let me, while, while you're thinking of the questions you want to ask, let me ask each of you, and, and I'm going to put you all on the spot, uh, if, you can, and if there's a single question that you could be asked that you would really love to answer. If you can, in a sentence, give that question and in a sentence, really putting you on the spot, what would your answer to it be? We can start. Yeah, all right, David. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think our side doesn't speak enough about um, the, the, internal Im the internal impact uh, of these ideas on us personally. We, we talk about sort of the historical impact of, of Darwinism, um, but how the sort of nihilism in the culture uh, affects us just in our, in our daily lives. You know, the, the sort of creeping doubt that even people who are religious feel and I, and I can tell you it, 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 it affects me it affects all of us and so I, I would want I would want someone to, to ask <laughs> ask me to speak about the um, sort of the existential uh, the, the psychological cost of Darwinism day to day even on people who are ostensibly quote unquote religious because I think we we often suppress that um, and everyone wants to feel like, well, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't impact me because I, you know, I've got the truth. But the, but the reality is it, it does affect us. And, and, mm -hmm. and I see this in the Jewish community, too. It, it's, it's a, it has a, these ideas, this Darwinian nihilism has a leech-like effect on our spiritual lives. And we can see clearly the difference between spiritual life today, post-Darwin, and pre-Darwin from just a few centuries ago, very different. We are, there's this sort of plague of, of doubt that we all carry around in us. And religious people in the Jewish community, I can say for sure, probably in the, in the Christian community as well, uh, are not frank enough in acknowledging that. And I think if we were, we'd have a clearer sense of what is at stake for us right now. Mm. Uh, I'll, whenever I'm asked questions like this, Marvin, I just answer with the first thing that pops into my head because I'm not getting anything better probably. And so I guess the question I'd want to be asked is can, if someone asks me, can we know if God is real? Uh, so the claim's not does God exist or should I have faith in God, but can, can we know that God 
is real. And there was, in the 20th century, there's, there was a, what I would call a fittiest turn among Christians in particular, in which we assumed that the natural world was hostile to our religious beliefs, and we sort of turned into ourselves so that we, we, we so uh, separated and isolated faith and reason, or public knowledge uh, from faith, uh, that we assumed that the sort of domain of knowledge and evidence was unfriendly, and that faith was a, purely an internal thing. That's not the traditional biblical or Christian position. The traditional position is Romans 1, from the foundation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from the things that have been made. That's a strong statement that from the things that have been made, from nature, uh, apart from God's special revelation in Scripture, things about God's nature can be clearly seen. I think that's the way God intended to reveal himself. The, the created order uh, provides revelatory knowledge of God as creator at all times and places, and that's the backdrop on the stage in front of which God acts in history in his special revelation. And so God's special revelation is intended to take place in the context of a created order that already testifies to its existence, so that if we're looking at it open-mindedly, uh, I think we can know something about the fact that there is a creator, and in fact, I think we can know that of more certainty and on the basis of different kinds of evidence in the 21st century than people ever had at previous times in history. Um, and I, I'm convinced of that, and I think that we should not, we should not be ashamed uh, to actually ask that question about whether we could know that a God exists and provide evidence publicly for it. Okay, Denise? Well, the question I wish someone would ask me is, if the majority of people in a country don't support Darwinism, why do they allow their tax money to be used yeah. to promote it and teach yeah. it for their children? I mean, I'd like to know how many of those public broadcasting programs are in fact supported by tax money. We all know that textbooks and schools are generally. I mean, if you can't afford private schooling, they're going to force you to send your kid to that school. Um, and I'm still researching the answer. But I can tell you one very brief thing. When Francis Collins' says The Language of God first came out, I was asked by two Canadian um, magazines, Christian ones, to write a review. Of, and I knew I had to praise the book. Absolutely no question I had to praise the book because he was an evangelical who had been appointed to a high place. So I did my best. I said, if your son wants to go get his thing of me pierced because he says there's no God, maybe you can use Francis Collins to persuade him that an intelligent person can believe in God. I, okay, they figured me out. <laughs> um, I can, I have great difficulty getting published in my own country. Okay. Still working on the answer. Leave it with you. <laughs> I definitely can't top that. Um, uh, the, the question I would like to be asked is, why am I not a theistic evolutionist? And I hear lots of reasons why people are theistic evolutionists. They're really bad reasons. I can't think of a single good reason I've heard to be a theistic evolutionist. One of the most common arguments I hear is Francis Collins. Well, oh, but, Francis Col but Francis Collins exists. He's a great guy, and he's a Christian and evolutionist. But, you know, I have, like Dr. Wells, also reviewed Dr. Collins' science quite a bit, and it is just wrong. I mean, you can, we can like him all we want, but he's just wrong. And so for me, the reason why I'm not a theistic evolutionist is because it doesn't hold up to the science. The science does not support Darwinian evolution. So you can give me all the bad reasons you want. At the end of the day, I want to know what the science says, and the science doesn't support Darwinian evolution. That's why I'm not a theistic evolutionist. Actually, the question I would most like to answer is about to be asked by the gentleman standing at the front of the line here. So if you don't mind, I'll pass to John. And then uh, rather than steal his thunder, I'll let him ask his question and then try to answer it. Yeah. It actually is. It's going to be an echo chamber because I think, again, the best questions asked are uh, what people who have spent their Saturday coming here and have actually stayed here in the afternoon, and so I'd like to hear people's questions. Hey, well, there's been a Vulcan mind meld between you and Dr. <laughs> Wells, so... 
You're on, and let's, we'll go back and forth. Again, this is not survival of the fittest, so you, <laughs> you're being very polite there. We'll start over here. Uh, hello, thank you. I was a little disappointed today because I came kind of hoping that we would address a middle ground a little bit more, and it seems that the clear answer at the conference today is, you know, God or evolution, no way, it's one or the other. And that's a little unfortunate because I was hoping that for people that are not believers, if they were to return to a belief in God but yet still be convinced of the scientific evidence, that there would be a, a possibility of return. But by drawing that line in the middle, it makes it makes it where you've either, it's either got to be Christianity or evolution. That, that seemed unfortunate. But my specific question was, can we, I'm not going to argue because I'm not in the position to argue it fully, but could we agree to a debate on endogenous retroviruses between Dr. Wells and possibly Collins or someone else? I'd be willing to assist in helping get that set up. But endogenous retroviruses, the question would be, do endogenous retroviruses clearly show that we evolved from primates and lower mammals. So would you agree to a debate on that specific topic with someone? Because I would love to learn more about it and see it fully debated and, and argued out precisely, because that endogenous retroviruses are very important. Well, good. Uh, yes, I would agree to a debate, although honestly, uh, the debates I've been in uh, often uh, devolve, so to speak, into <laughs> hockey matches. I mean, uh, it's a matter of sco scoring goals rather than really getting at the truth. But yes, if Francis Collins were willing to debate this, I would be happy to do it. I doubt that he'll agree to that, but that's another matter. Would, would as far as endogenous retroviruses are concerned, uh, you're referring to Collins's argument, I assume, in the language of God, that a particular transposon, jumping gene, landed in the same place in the human and chimp genome. Uh, <clears throat> it's interesting, when I read the book, I tried to track down exactly what the evidence was for that. As I said, Collins uses a term that does not appear in the scientific literature. He does not provide any citations, and despite an exhaustive search, exhaustive, well, lengthy search on my part, uh, I was not able to find out what exactly, what element he was talking about. So I cannot address specifically his argument. Uh, what I can say is <clears throat> that uh, it hinges on the assertion that the element is functionless. If the element functions, then its location in the same spot in two genomes could have a functional reason. In fact, it probably would. So it all depends on its not having function, upon its being junk. And as I said in my talk, and this is true, the more we study the so-called junk DNA, the more function we uncover. So I would not consider that uh, a propitious start for Collins' argument. Uh, the last thing I would say on it is, <clears throat> if one gene, this particular gene, provides evidence for common ancestry of chimps and humans, what about the many genes that don't? For example, it was reported just recently that the uh, human and chimp Y chromosomes, the chromosome that uh, specifies male characteristics. Uh, those two chromosomes in humans and chimps are radically different. Radically. And so if one jumping gene supposedly provides evidence for common ancestry, what do we say about the many genes on the Y chromosome that seem to point in the other direction? So if we're going to talk about evidence for something, we also have to talk about the evidence against it. So absolutely. Should I, should I, if I email Jay on that one? Or? On the debate? Yeah. Yeah, hey, if you Francis want to fund Collins, that debate, been, we're just all Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just so you know, there have been multiple efforts to actually set up debates between France, or even discussions between Francis Collins and people like Stephen Meyer, and Collins has repeatedly declined. I, and, I, and, and, and he makes almost a point of going in places as, as making a precondition um, of, of not sharing, you know, the podium. So that has, there's been a lot of talk out of Biologos of sponsoring sort of, uh, you know, discussions and things, and we're fortunate in this, later this month, several mm -hmm. of our people will be actually interfacing in a public venue with several of them, but Collins, of all the people, has been very clear about not doing that. I, I think, you know, Casey, I know, has something else on the science. Eventually, I want to say something about what you asked about the middle ground, because I think yeah. there is an interesting point. 
Do you want Very to briefly on the science, if you go to evolutionnews.org and search for endogenous retroviruses, you can find a few blog posts from myself and Dr. Richard Sternberg that discuss functions that have been discovered for endogenous retroviruses. They're just like all the other types of DNA, uh, junk DNA that Dr. Wells discussed. As time goes on, we're discovering more and more function. Um, I would love to see a debate. I wish Francis Collins would be willing to debate that. I know, Dr. Wells, that you would be more than happy to debate him on that point. Um, this is not an unwillingness on our part <laughs> to engage in a dialogue. I can assure you all that. Yeah. I We love to do debates. As a, I'll make that a sort of blanket statement. But I do want to address what you said at the beginning because I don't think it. I, I, quite frankly, I'm not sure if you were here at the beginning. Uh, I started with a talk in which I gave eight definitions of evolution, eight common definitions of the word, and only one of the eight did I say was logically incompatible with ro uh, theism in any robust sense. The blind watchmaker thesis. I, it's just the simplest thing in the world. Uh, and you read Casey's article, he just over and over and over, I made Casey shorten his article about six times in the book because he kept citing textbooks. Darwinism means uh, random genetic mutations, work, natural selection acting on random genetic mutations produce adaptive complexity in biology. And random is always defined as purposeless. Uh, but theism claims that God orders things purposefully, providentially. That's just logic. It doesn't even matter what the evidence is. You can see that right there. So there's got to be some definition of evolution that's incompatible with theism. It's that one. It's the blind watchmaker thesis. It's definition number eight. You can absolutely believe in God and evolution uh, one through seven. In fact, you can believe in uh, definition eight. It's just an incoherent belief, I argue. And you know, I, I can't imagine what the response to that would be. The, the point I would want to make on that is I think post-Hegel and certainly post-modern field, we always want to find a way to get along and that all ideas are somehow can be reconciled and made compatible. And I think that what Jay is saying is right. There are many meanings of evolution, even as I've said here, universal common ancestry that I think you can hold coherently. But at the end of the day, and sociologically, it is true that people, are there many Christians who are, believe abortion is a good thing? Yes, there are. Are they sincere Christians? Yes. I happen to believe they're wrong. So I do think the question is not whether we have an artificial middle ground or whether you can be a Christian and, and, and even believe, try to square like Francis Collins. I think he's a sincere Christian. Try to square it with the blind watchmaker thesis. The question is what's true? And also, you know, are, what is this about our, our psychology that we sort of need to think that everything has to be reconcilable? I'm sorry, but everything, ideas are not all reconcilable. There are some ideas that are... Uh, can't be reconciled, and I would say it's pretty hard logically, consistently, coherently to reconcile, and just to make people feel good and say, you can be a Christian and have whatever belief you want. To me, that really is a devaluation as a Christian, not speaking, not as an ID proponent, but as a Christian, that's a really, uh, that's a path I wouldn't want to go down. I would say, God will take you wherever you are, God loves you, you know, accept Christ as your savior, as a, as a Christian, but is that where we want to end it? And that then you can believe whatever you want to believe. You know, if you want to be a social Darwinist, if you want to be a eugenist, as most Darwinists were, and you know, sterilize the people you consider unfit, that's fine because as a Christian, you can believe anything. If you want to believe in slavery, there were Christians who believed in slavery. Are we willing to say, we don't want to offend those people. They actually made that argument in the 19th century evangelicals. Some made the argument, we don't want to offend the good Bible-believing Southern slave owners. Well, Again, that doesn't mean everything's unreconcilable, but I do think we need to try to seek clarity. And so we're trying to offer arguments. And if one disagrees, then we should argue on that and say, well, maybe it is reconcilable or not. But just this craving for that everything is middle ground and that uh, you can reconcile everything, I think, is something that is really not healthy. Yeah, and I believe, yeah, I believe in letting that patient person over there ask a question now. Thank you. Uh, just this week, uh, one of my family members had asked me if I would look at the uh, PBS series, uh, God in America, which I uh, uh, sat through for all this week. And uh, basically the reason they were wanting me to watch it is because we've had talks and dialogues for quite some time. And they were hoping that I could see the light that while mine was a biased evangelical view of the interpretation of the history of America, I was now going to get the facts on the issues. And uh, I actually, thankful uh, Marvin, I did send them your review 
in, in World Magazine, which was somewhat of interest and help. But my question is this, is uh, the people I'm referring to are actually Christians, but they've been influenced by a whole culture. And this is just one example of many you could see. And what was happening is I'm wondering, how do you respond to a community, you know, average people? They've got, say, relatively a bachelor's degree out of a major university. And they, they look at this and they see this as presenting finally a factual interpretation of what was going on in the history of America. And if you try to counterattack it, they are basically looking at you as, well, of course, I would expect you to say that because you're biased and these people aren't. Uh, I guess my question is, one, if any of you have seen that, I assume some of you have, and have a response just generally of a critique of it shortly, and then how would you approach someone who would uh, be in that kind of situation? I think there's a lot of general people in our culture now that if they've seen it, whether they will express it or not, uh, they would see that as pretty much uh, with the view of, uh, of uh, Darwinism, uh, the whole Scopes Monkey trial. There right. were many uh, things through there. Anyone who wants to take that? Whose favorite question is that? <laughs> I haven't seen it yet, so I, I'd just be speaking out of ignorance, which well, I'm not well, opposed well, to, but I won't do it this time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> let, me, let me try to phrase that in a general way, and, yeah. then, and then we'll try to go quickly to, to other questions. The general way would be, let's say someone who has received the standard issue public school education and has absorbed from major media the standard issue understanding of who Christians are and so forth. Where do you begin cracking that? I'd recommend beginning by having them look f at the um, FIRE website, Freedom of Individuals. Um, rights in Education. I I um, yes, Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. Sorry, I do consult their site a lot, uh, despite my inability to parse their um, acronym. acronym. Yes, uh, fundamentally, what you learn there is that there is no reign of terror bigger happening in the United States, apart from the war on the drug industry, I mean uh, illegal drugs, than you will find on the university campus. I mean, I, I'm a Catholic, I go to a traditional Catholic church. If I started spouting heretical doctrines, a priest would simply tell me that I'm spouting heretical doctrines and I don't have the educational background to understand it. He would not drive me out or cause me any further trouble, um, you know, as a private person. You won't find anything like that on campuses today. Um, it's amazing what's happening. What I'm saying briefly is, don't think only of the intelligent design controversy. In general, it's the least liberal part of American society. It's engaged in a program, as far as I can see, of social engineering to make everyone think the same thing and to regard the people who provide that information as sources of wisdom. That's what you're dealing with. It's like the missionary going to confront the witch doctor, is what it's like. All I can say is, good luck, pray a lot, and keep at it. Uh, or as they said in England during World War II, keep, keep calm and carry on. <laughs> Over here. Yes. Uh, a couple, like about three or four weeks ago, I read a couple headlines that caught my attention on uh, Yahoo.com. And they were, uh, has Stephen Hawking ended the God debate? And the other article was, Stephen Hawking, God was not needed to create the universe. And then, basically, they summar in summary, they said, you know, the Big Bang was the result of inevitable laws of physics and did not need God to spark the creation of the universe. And what I'm kind of wondering is, can you explain how Hawking has concluded these things and what has been the theistic response to mm -hmm. Hawking's claims in this area? I'll answer that very briefly. I actually have a piece coming out in The American probably this week uh, responding to Hawking, but several people have responded to him well. I can answer the first question, you know, has God ended the God debate? 
Well, obviously not. Everybody's talking about God as a result of the press release from his book, right? Um, the, but the book is called The Grand Design. He wrote it with another uh, California physicist. And Hawking, I have read it, and he actually doesn't have anything especially new in the book, and not even new compared to other things he's written. But he essentially argues that based on uh, what the thing that's called M theory, which is a cluster of theories, um, because, see, Hawking since the 1970s, Hawking proved a set of theorems with another physicist named Roger Penrose in the 70s uh, that essentially proved that if basic general relativity is right and the out contours of Big Bang cosmology is right, then the universe had to begin in a singularity, a sort of, you know, a mathematical point in the finite past in which the universe, uh, you know, sort of um, focused down, at least mathematically, into a point of, of infinite, uh, infinite density and zero volume. And that has sort of unsavory theological implications to almost everyone that thinks about it, including Hawking. He has spent the last 40 years, I think, trying to get, you know, 30 years trying to get around the theistic implications of, uh, the, frankly, the evidence of cosmology that he's an expert in. Uh, and, and John Lennox, Oxford mathematician, about three days after the Hawking, you know, press release, uh, it, it, frankly, it was a media blitz when his book came out. Uh, John Lennox responded, I think it was in the UK Telegraph, and just pointed out that Hawking's a smart physicist and mathematician, but he's not a logician because he's making a category errors. Um, he, he actually says, because we have a law of gravity, he actually says this, the universe can create itself spontaneously out of nothing. Now, when somebody says something can create itself spontaneously out of nothing, you know something's gone wrong, right? <laughs> I mean, it's just about as bad as it gets. It's like denying the law of non-contradiction in your first premise. You know, if you do that, you learn that people learn this in logic class. You can prove anything in three, less than three steps. Well, if things can create themselves spontaneously out of nothing, anything that happens, you can just say, well, it created itself spontaneously out of nothing, right? Uh, and Hawking is saying that the universe itself does that because he knows the universe is not eternal. Now, he has a way of doing it, uh, but it's quite clear that Hawking is at bottom making a category error. It's the, math it's the mathematical value of what we call the law of gravity in the universe, it's one of the things we're trying to explain. It's not a causal agent. In fact, physical laws themselves are not causal agents. They describe the behavior of matter in this universe under certain descriptions. They don't, they don't create things. And so he's, he's using a law, a sort of mathematically descriptive law about what is true in the universe as if it's a causal agent for bringing the universe into existence. And that's what John Lennox, again, another equally smart guy at Oxford rather than Cambridge, pointed out. It's just a simple category error. Um, and and I, I frankly think if, if somebody says the universe created itself spontaneously out of nothing, that to me is a reduction to the absurd of materialism. I mean, it just doesn't get any worse than that. Um, because, I mean, the 19th century, you could treat the universe as eternal. We didn't have empirical evidence that the universe was finite. And so a lot of scientists just said the universe has always existed. We don't need to ask where it came from. Well, the second, we had evidence that the universe is expanding, that it, it came into existence in the finite past. You could no longer resist the question. Uh, it was sort of the evidence of nature itself pressed upon you the question, where did it come from? Um, Hawking is, is trying to get the universe to bootstrap itself into existence out of nothing. Um, he's free to have that as an option, I suppose, because if anything, that sort of, I, that to me puts the options in stark relief. And that to me is evidence that there's never been a better time to be a theist, at least as far as the you know, uh, evidence of physics is concerned. So that's question. a long-winded answer, sorry. A question over there. Uh, yeah. Um, We've heard that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, which is fairly empirically true, I think. And on those grounds, I think we're fighting the wrong battle in a certain area. The problem is not atheism in our schools. The problem is not creationism in our schools or evolution in our schools. The problem is government in our schools. I'm serious about that. We, uh, when, you give our, uh, we, when we give our children over to any government, doesn't matter which kind of government it is. Over time, it will become a mind control system because they want to get, educate people to reelect them. <laughs> and the biggest systematic change, the most helpful systematic change we could make in America today would be to get government out of our schools and give it back to the parents and back to the students and back to non-government organizations. It, because then you can have, again, a free market of ideas. We don't have a free market of ideas anymore. That, that makes sense. Do you have a question? Yeah. 
I guess my question is, do you agree? I mean, is this, is this something we need to work on in terms of this issue we're talking about? Um, re regardless of how I would say my answer was, regardless of how one thinks about the government schools, I'd say, uh, if you do send your kids to public schools, um, you shouldn't think that that is the end of your responsibility. Or even if you send your kids to private schools. I think parents, it's something that with two small elementary school aged children, I know my wife and I have learned, uh, if you want your children to subscribe to uh, the beliefs that you have or, or the view of the world or, or the facts as you know them, uh, parents need have an obligation to, and, and actually all adults uh, with the children in your life, to uh, be a teacher. And so regardless of who should run the schools or, or how the school educational system should be done, I do think that everyone needs to know that they have that obligation. And I think something else that the questioner brought up about really the corrupting dangers of, of having any sort of entity that sort of controls things or, or controls thought, this gets back to the earlier question about what do you do when people have sort of imbibed the PBS version of history or something. I think more generally, one of the things that we need to teach ourselves and our kids is a healthy skepticism. And that's a questioning attitude, and that means that even kids who are, grow up in faith need to learn actually even to question in a good way even you know, their faith to test it and find it right. But it certainly means that just because science says so, or the, which means usually the current clique in science says so. I mean, a century ago, science said that eugenics was good science. It was a deduction of Darwinian theory. Now we say that's preposterous and wrong. Well, for four decades in America or more, the consensus of the scientific community said it was right. One of the ways of getting the people who just so imbibe what they see in the media is actually, again, bringing them up examples that they themselves might respect of where the elites have been wrong, where the media have gotten it wrong. To, so to get people thinking, on what basis are we believing this? Do we just read it in the newspaper and then I just believe it? Most people will tell you, at least in some area they know about, that they read it in the newspaper, apologies to journalists, but it is that it's not always right, and that journalists' own belief structures influence things. And so this is a way of thinking that people need to be cultivated into so that they'll at least be receptive to studying different ideas. Exactly right. Question? Uh, yes. First, I'd like to thank everyone for even being able to pose a question to such a great panel. My question is, when discussing with uh, atheists and skeptics, a uh, question I get back a lot of time, what does it matter where humans come from? And I, I don't know how to correctly answer mm. that question. Well, if they say that, do you ask them, so you wouldn't care if uh, science teachers in public schools taught all the kids that God created us a few thousand years ago? Uh, they, uh, I bet you and most of them get really exercised at that possibility. So they're not telling you the truth. They obviously think it does matter. Um, and everybody knows it matters, you know. And so now if they do say, no, that'd be fine with me, then, you know, you've got a sort of consistent atheist. But I suspect you expose the pretense of the claim. Um, you know, where we come from is the fundamental question you have to ask in order to say, what are we? What kind of beings are we? What's appropriate to our station and to our nature? Uh, how should society be structured and all those sorts of things. So it's in some ways it's sort of the first question you ask. Uh, the good news, frankly, is that everybody, almost everybody knows that it's a significant question unless they're, they're trying this, this strategy. Yeah, and you all have one book to read now that you've received today, but I'd also like to recommend John West's book, Darwin mm -hmm. Day in America, yeah. that really answers that question. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yes, um, I'm a, a public high school science teacher, and so I'm on the front lines here. Welcome. <laughs> And uh, I really think uh, intelligent design is the way to challenge evolution, but I was going to ask you what you thought were the best fronts for, for challenging that in a public high school. I can, uh, I can address that, and also this will hopefully get back to the previous question about government-funded public schools. Part of my role at Discovery Institute is to help advise teachers on how they can teach this issue more effectively. So I work with a lot of public school teachers, so it's great to talk to you today. Um, I personally went to public schools from kindergarten through my master's degree uh, here in Southern California. I graduated from Long Beach Poly High School, not too far away from here. And I had a great experience in public schools, but unfortunately, as you're well aware, the vast majority of public schools today teach only the science supporting evolution. They really censor from students any non-evolutionary views. That was certainly my experience going to public schools here in the LA area. Um, I had professors that, that actually showed videos um, our teachers in high school that actually showed videos uh, that explicitly said that 
in, at that time they called it creationism, explicitly said creationism was wrong. And it's interesting to ask about the constitutional implications of that if, if creationism is a religious viewpoint. But in any case, Discovery Institute's approach on how to deal with this issue in public schools is that we actually don't favor pushing intelligent design into the curriculum. We think that ID should be a scientific debate and not a political one. And we found that when ID does get pushed into the curriculum, when it's mandated in public schools, unfortunately that tends to politicize the debate and takes it out of the scientific realm, whereas our priority is to see ID develop and mature and grow as a science. And, and we don't, so we don't favor forcing it into public schools. As far as what public schools should do, um, they should teach both the evidence for and against evolution. And there's a lot of great curricular resources that Discovery Institute fellows have helped to develop. Um, there's a, uh, a video based upon Jonathan Wells' book, Icons of Evolution, that is great for using in public school classrooms. There's the supplementary biology textbook, Explore Evolution, which uh, all these resources are strictly scientific. They talk about many of the scientific flaws and the standard lines of evidence used to support evolution in public schools. And go read Icons of Evolution if you want to know more about that. But, and I'd be happy to speak with you more afterwards. But I think that there's a lot that public school uh, teachers can do to effectively teach this issue. Um, going back to the question of should the government even be in public schools, and the answer was, you know, that parents have a responsibility. Parents also have a responsibility to get involved not just in their students, at, uh, their, their children's learning at home, but also in the public schools. We hopefully still live in something of a democracy here where you can actually run for local school, the local school board and help to advocate for positive changes. Despite what the NCSE and what some of the Darwin lobbyists might tell you, there is nothing unconstitutional about teaching both the scientific evidence for and against evolution in public school science classrooms. And there's lots of peer-reviewed scientific journals, uh, articles that support the challenges that we recommend bringing. So I, that's the kind of approach that we would recommend. But having said that, it's also the case that in K through 12, you really don't have academic freedom. And so I think if, any, if you in particular want to do anything or anyone else who's a public school teacher, you really should talk to Casey because it, there's also a, a practical matter of, you know, what are you allowed to do in your district? What are your district standards? Of course, in California, there are state science standards, which actually, if fairly applied, would, should allow you to teach, actually, about some of the controversies there because there are certain things in the science standards that actually allow you to get into things. But it, it is also very fact-specific about what the environment is like in your school district because you don't have a First Amendment right, unfortunately, as a, as a K through 12 teacher to say, well, I'm going to go against what you know, my district says. But having said that, if your district is, is favorable or at least is uh, neutral, there are certainly uh, ways that are pedagogically appropriate and also constitutional that can be done and Casey would be a good resource. And I know how hard public school teachers work, so thank you for what you do. Yes. Hello. Um, I was wondering if could there, uh, what's your opinion of old earth yet no evolution? Like four billion, like the earth is about four billion years old, but evolution didn't pl take place because it would take many hundreds of billions of years to effectively create what's happened now. So How, basically, God. you define evolution there? What do you mean, no evolution? I, um, um yeah. Look, Basically, no, Darwin, no Darwinian evolution, okay. or, uh, but, we're, but the Earth is still very old. Everybody's looking at me because I wrote The Privileged Planet, I guess. I, I, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I know. I, I spoke. Um, you know, my own view, I mean, I, I hold the sort of standard views, I suppose, the, on the age of the universe and the Earth. Uh, I, th I think Darwinian evolution explains some things. I just yes. think that it's uh, mostly really trivial things that nobody much disputes in terms of, you know, we, the way we often put it is the arrival or the survival of the fittest yeah. versus the arrival of the fittest. There simply is no empirical evidence that the Darwinian mechanism has the creative capacity to build any major new systems in biology. We, we know the kinds of things that we could discover if it had that power. It doesn't. In fact, there's, there's not a whole lot of evidence that 
natural selection and directed genetic mutations does anything very interesting. And so I just, it just stuns me how little sort of empirical evidence there is for that claim. And so I just don't think it's true. Um, now, you know, which organisms share common ancestors with which others? I'm sort of agnostic on that. I don't know, maybe cats. I, I, I don't know. I don't feel like those are the kind of really the central issues. I think uh, the, the broader questions, who did it? Was it designed? Was it purposive? Was it not purposive? Uh, those kinds of questions are the central ones. And I think some of these things are, frankly, almost impossible to answer simply because they'd be empirical questions about things that happened in the past that we might not have direct evidence for. So that's my own view, is that d the Darwinian mechanism, though true, is very trivial. Um, and that the, the physical universe is chock full of evidence for purpose and design. Yeah. Jonathan? Well, I agree. And I, I, speaking as a scientist myself, I don't think it's the job of science to provide this all-encompassing story of what happened, I'm not saying you do either, of what happened since the Earth was formed four and a half billion years ago until now. It's the job of science to propose theories and test them against the evidence. And there are plenty of scientists who do this and never even get into the origins issue. Uh, structuralists, if you've heard of that field in, in biology. Uh, cladistics. Uh, all of these things could be done without even raising the question which we can't answer anyway, of who was the common ancestor and how did it happen. So there's a lot of good uh, bioengineering, physiology. Most areas of science, in biology even, do not need the Darwinian story to be very productive. <clears throat> oh, David? Just one, one, one quick aside is that there's a, great, uh, there's, there's a great saying in the Talmud that a person should try to teach his mouth to say, I don't know. <laughs> and it's very, it's very hard. We, we always feel like we have to have an answer, you know, and, you know, it's okay, whether in science or journalism, which is my, my own field, to say, I don't know. And it's okay, it's okay not to know. David, by the way, has one of the great lines in his, in his essay in the book where uh, uh, you're men mentioning various mysteries and I guess the response is, well, when I see God someday, I'll ask him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, my problem with uh, theistic evolution and biologos in particular is its a assault on biblical inerrancy in our evangelical institutions. And I'd like to ask your opinion of how we in evangelical institutions can best prepare our constituents to defend that the Bible is indeed the word of God. I think those of you who um uh, are donating to, I know from my former institution, uh, where I was a tenured faculty member, had lots of people donate money thinking that they, their students, that they were saying they were getting one thing, when in fact they weren't. When Carl Guyberson went on his lecture tour last year promoting Saving Darwin, he went to a lot of Christian colleges. I may be wrong, but I think there was only one university that put him on with a forum with someone who disagreed with him. That was Biola. And that had to be really credit. But that means that all of the other places, I know at Seattle Pacific, when he came to Seattle, it was sort of as a captive audience that the, the Darwinist biology professors wanted to force their kids to go to and only get one-sided view. So I think that especially parents and donors have a huge role to play in the, in the area of Christian higher education, uh, particularly, of demanding that their kids get more than, uh, Biola is a great example, because Biola will bring in atheists to debate. Biola will bring, they're not trying to shelter your students here, you're trying to actually get, let them compare and contrast, become thinking individuals. What's happening in a lot of Christian colleges is they're just simply trying to shut down thought, and in the case of theistic Darwinism, just get that, and don't allow students to ask any other questions. I remember having a faculty member once who boasted sort of that, uh, I think they drove a student out of their program because of, uh, well, in that case, she was a biblical creationist, and they didn't want her there. What kind of attitude is that? And so, and that's really an antithetical, anti-education attitude. But so you as parents, as prospective, if you're thinking of sending your kids to a Christian college, you can ask some interesting questions, like in the area of biology. So how many, what are the views of the biologist in your department? How many support intelligent design? How many may be biblical creationists? How many support theistic evolution? And, and ask them. Uh, you might be surprised. Don't uh, accept pat answers like, well, we're integrating faith and science. That's so vague. That's a slogan. And so if you ask specific answers, you'll get 
them likely, and then that gives you authority and power. And don't, don't send a contribution to a place that is going to you know, promote something, a one-sided orthodoxy that you don't support. And that's also true with secular schools. It's, I'll just end on this. Uh, in Iowa State University, it was known as sort of the state university institution in Iowa that if Christians were going to support state higher education, that's where they donate because it was apparently more faith-friendly, supposedly, than the University of Iowa. So you had a lot of conservative Christians give a lot of money to Iowa State University. Well, Iowa State University should go down in infamy because they denied tenure to uh, Guillermo Gonzalez, one of the gifted up-and-coming astronomers who had a cover story in Scientific American, who had 350% more peer-reviewed publications than required for excellence, according to their own standards for tenure. But he was too hot, you know, he was too insufficient to be able to get tenure there. At the same time, the same year, he was denied tenure. They promoted an atheist religion professor who wrote a book comparing unfavorably the Bible to Hitler's Mein Kampf, and said Hitler's Mein Kampf was better than the Bible. So, but every Christian who donates money to Iowa State University is bankrolling it, even if you're giving money to the sports program there. So, you know, people ask taxpayers' money, what if people with their voluntary contributions are giving hundreds of millions of dollars a year to higher education, writing a check for warm emotional feelings based off of, you know, that maybe they had 50 or 30 or 40 years ago with no strings attached, and that money is, in, in many cases, going to support ideas completely antithetical to the people who write the checks. Just two quick comments and then a question. I resonate very well with my Jewish brother there who said that the Sabbath is a sign of God's creativity, creative power. And it seems to me that from what you said that God anticipated these questions that we are raising about creation and established a sign in time to answer the question before we actually started to ask the question. That's just one comment. Another comment, I appreciate the fact that we gave some different definitions of evolution. And that leads me to my question. Could we distinguish between science fiction, scientism, and science? Do you think that Stephen Hawkins and others like him conflate those three terms and sometimes are purveying for us what may really be science fiction, but using the credibility and prestige of science to convey their ideas? Yeah, I do think that's right. And science fiction can be great for illustrative purposes, but you know, I, I've discovered this, that most things that people think they know about physics, unless they've taken a physics course, they actually got from Star Trek The Next Generation, unfortunately. Um, you know, and it's not all bad, actually. But, um, but you said scientism. I, I want to define that because that is an important thing because there's several different things we're dealing with. Scientism is a, a claim of epistemology, and it's basically the claim that the methods of natural science are the privileged ways of knowing either reality or knowing the natural world. So it's, it's not saying that science is a good thing or that we can discover truths using a scientific method, but rather that the very tools of science are precisely the way that we want to gain knowledge in every case. And so insofar as knowing something doesn't measure up to whatever criteria we have, then it's not knowledge. And there is that sort of danger so that you know, there's some things like moral intuitive knowledge that we have. It's knowledge. I know torturing little kids for the fun of it is wrong. I know it's wrong. Um, you all do too, actually. And you really know you know it if you think about it, but it's not exactly an empirical piece of knowledge. But if you're scientistic, you think, well, unless you can sort of test it in a laboratory or verify it, then it can't be true. Um, so that is a problem. Uh, I don't think, often though, what we're dealing with is not scientism per se, but scientific materialism in which materialistic assumptions about the nature of reality, not the nature of knowledge, but the nature of reality, work their way into the content of science. And so very often we treat highly conjectural narratives that Darwinians provide as if it's data from, si from science, you know? Uh, when in what it is is it's, well, it's, it's based on this unstated assumption, something like this must be true, so then that allows me to construct a narrative, and you don't ever stop and say, actually, we have no data for that, there's no evidence for it, it's just, it's a story. Uh, and so it's important to distinguish scientism, which is kind of a theory about 
knowledge or how we gain knowledge from uh, scientific materialism, which is more a claim about, uh, about the nature of reality. They're both bad, and we're sort of dealing with both of those. Uh, but the, most of what we've been talking about here today has been scientific materialism, I think. And I love science fiction, despite right what I may have right said here. earlier. <laughs> well, um, we're just about out of time. Um, I hate to cut off people who have been standing patiently. Yeah, and I think let's continue. Let's continue. Let's do it. Okay, but let's see if we could have one sentence questions and two or three sentence answers. I'm out. <laughs> uh, I'd really like to answer the question that the, while I've been standing here, my, my what I wanted to say has undergone major evolution. <laughs> <coughs> but is, since the boy over there asked the question, uh, it, the guy in the blue shirt asked the question that I don't think was adequately answered, I, I'd like to try. I've, I've uh, been a professional earth scientist for 25 years. And basically, I don't think the panel shows a good recognition of how scientists think about evolution and how they have come to their conclusions about evolution. But the, the primary arguments in support of evolution come from geology and paleontology. Life, according to the geologists, started about 3.8 billion years ago. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to ask a question. Okay, I don't have a question. <laughs> But, but the, the, there, are, there are fossils throughout the sequence. You can't say that, that all, all creation of life began recently because there are fossils throughout the sedimentary layers, through the whole thing, which are clear and obvious. Right. So, yeah. but I, I think if, if anybody us... said the opposite, uh, say so. I don't think we, anyone claimed otherwise, but go ahead. Yeah, I don't think anybody up here uh, would actually disagree with that student's uh, approach. I think that the view that the Earth is four and a half billion years old and that Darwinian evolution really fails to explain a lot of the data is an extremely defensible position. I say that as someone with both a bachelor's and master's degree in Earth Sciences from UC San Diego. It was the guy in the lab next door to me who was a grad student working on the finding that where they found the 3.8 billion year life. Um, I think it's a very defensible position. As far as fossils go, you're absolutely right. There has, there's evidence of change over time in the fossil record. Uh, Jay talked about this, that we can define evolution as change over time, but the question is, do we find Darwinian evolution represented in the fossil record? What we find in the fossil record is we see a pattern of explosions of new forms of life. We see mass explosions of biodiversity at various stages throughout the history of life where many different forms come into uh, existence very rapidly without, without any clear evolutionary precursors. The Cambrian explosion, the plant explosion, the mammal explosion. People even, have even described the uh, origin of our own genus Homo as an explosion. So we do not see evidence, I would say, of Darwinian change in the fossil record. Uh, we do see change, but it's not Darwinian change. It's perhaps something else. Hi, I'm a student here at Biola, and I had the privilege of going to a recent seminar at the Discovery, at Seattle Pacific University with the Discovery Institute. So I actually recognize many of the panel members here. And one thing in particular that struck me from that conference is something that I'll ask in question form here today for the benefit of others um, that are my age, and that is, what is the role of the student in this particular debate? The future. <laughs> and I'd encourage you that if you are a student at Biola or at any other university and are interested in the sciences, or now we have a contingent for the social sciences and humanities, uh, consider applying to our summer program. It's an intense 10-day 10 um, 10-day opportunity in July. Uh, the applications will be online as of January on our website, and it is uh, for particularly for people who are wanting to go into graduate school to have an impact. And uh, so I think you know. New ideas often take new people to adopt them, and so if you want to look toward the future, you need to look at the students now. If I could add to that briefly? Sure. sure. Uh, I, I don't, it's a tough question. It's a very tough question. I don't think it's the job of students to fall on their swords in front of their Darwinist professors. Uh, on the other hand, I wouldn't want students to lie about their real convictions. So it's a very tough choice because it's a tough world in this situation right now in this country. Uh, I would say study hard, get good grades, 
uh, keep an open mind and uh, pray for the future. When I was a grad student at Scripps Institute of Social Monography, uh, there was a well-known evolutionist professor named Russell Doolittle, he's mentioned in Darwin's Black Box, who came and lectured to us as to why Behe was wrong. And this was a little graduate seminar, and he actually told our class that his best weapon against what he called the creationists, he lumps them all together, his best weapon, he said, was ridicule, and that's the exact word he used. So be prepared. If you're a student at a major, you know, secular state public university, you have to be prepared for taking some lumps for what you believe, and I agree with Dr. Wells. You may not always be in a position, and it may not always be smart for you to uh, go around and try to stir up trouble, but definitely study hard and, and do the best you can and get good grades, and, and someday your day will come. First, thank you, David, for coming on the Jewish Sabbath. I appreciate that. Um, I also appreciate the fact that you chose not to use a microphone and, and respect your religious traditions. My uh, question is for Jonathan Wells, specifically. My favorite enzyme is the adenosine triphosphate synthase. Okay? I, I've been waiting to say that for the last 10 minutes. That's my favorite question. So, so I, I'm, 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 done. I'm done now. No. Um, my question is, in viewing Christ as the creator, the where John uses the term logos, I'm kind of weaving my other question into this, but um, viewing God as the creator. Um, as a biologist, the more you know, do you find that it increases your, your faith in God and how clearly you see design in complete contrast to the notion that we believe some sort of a God of the gaps concept? Do you find that it, the more you know, the, the greater detail that you are able to discern in life enlivens and strengthens your faith in God and his design? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Very, very much so. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Okay. <laughs> um, does the modern theistic evolution position necessarily entail open theism? Um, there certainly are synergies between that and process theism, and in fact, Francis Collins gave a keynote at a, at a, a conference just a couple of years ago on open theism and science, and so I'd say that there certainly are some uh, connections there, um, but I would also say, that, uh, yeah, I mean, there, obviously if you think that God... I would say that, that, that Darwinism or Darwinist theism, uh, theistic evolution, goes though even further because the open theist would at least say that um, God does have some sort of foreknowledge but he doesn't, they claim that he can only know those things that, are being, you know, that can be known. Theistic Darwinism by uh, actually saying God doesn't really know what he himself is doing. So I'd say uh, the theistic evolution goes even further. So even if you happen to be an open theist, and I'm not, I actually don't think it's... Uh, really fits the traditional uh, Christian teaching. But even if you did happen to be an open theist, the sort of theistic Darwinist answer goes even beyond that. Because the open theist at least usually would admit that God knows what he himself is doing. <laughs> and, and the theistic Darwinist are basically saying, well, God set up this process to create and he himself doesn't know the outcome of what he himself in some sense is supposed to be doing. So I'd say it goes even beyond that. Uh, yes, I was, um, I'm, I really appreciate hearing more about the Jewish and Roman Catholic perspectives because I didn't know much about those, but I was wondering what, if any, has been the Eastern Orthodox response to theistic evolution? You know, we, I'm sort of frustrated we didn't include uh, Eastern Orthodoxy. In fact, I have a colleague uh, that's Eastern Orthodox at the Discovery Institute, but it, frankly, it was just a matter of, gosh, I don't, we don't know enough people that have dealt with this, you know, more than anything, but actually the same basic debate does take place, and in fact, very, in one very prominent uh, Orthodox theologian is uh, a young earth creationist, and um, the, the debate does take place, but uh, it, the reality is that in, in American context, Orthodoxy is, you know, it's fairly small. Um, but the same basic issues uh, pervade the debate uh, among folks in Orthodox tradition, so far as I can tell. Uh, this may be a little out of context, but I know someone earlier asked the Stephen Hawking question, and so usually that always gets me thinking about the singularity and the Big Bang Theory. Um, so have you ever heard of this idea of, um, I'm sure you have, uh, 
a, uh, a universal clock based on the idea of redshift uh, wavelengths, um, and that was based on the cosmic background radiation um, that they've discovered, you know, in the last 10 years. And using that um, universal clock to say that looking from God's perspective, they can see the universe is six billion years, right. but if you look back because of the relativity of time, um, it, it, it actually looks like six days, you yeah. know? Um, have you heard of that? And mm -hmm. is that a, a valid possibility or has there been things to disprove this? Uh, the question, it's actually, the person that I know of that proposed this is a, a Gerald Schroeder, He's a, a Jewish physicist uh, from Israel. He has a series of books uh, and he proposes this in one. And the basic idea is he uses general relativity to argue that from God's reference frame, uh, you sort of think of it this way, God experientially, when he's sort of his acts of creation in six days, he experiences them from his reference frame is 24 hours, but those 24 hours cosmically correspond to oh. different time periods. Right, so I, I stated it. Yeah, right, the, so right, the right, first right, one's I, like it, right. several billion years, and then each day gets shorter cosmically, so it's just a few thousand years at the end. Um, and I, I was very interested in it when I read it. I don't know of any refutation of it. That's it's one of those things that seems really clever, and I, my own view on that is, yeah, maybe that's true. I don't know. It, but it's, it's the sort of thing I, I, I sit loosely on it either way. But it's certainly an interesting idea. Okay, thank you. Good. Last question. Um, I noticed that there are two prevailing uh, approaches to the question of God as creator. And there are some who are persuaded by empirical evidence and rational argument, and um, many of your responses have addressed that. Then there are those for whom it's mainly an existential issue or a spiritual issue. Does this God have power to save me? Or does this God have power to deliver my cousin mm -hmm. or something? And I think that is more in the postmodern world where we're going to get to eventually if we're not already there. So <clears throat> sometimes if these two things can coexist in the same person, especially in this generation. So for those of you who are coming from the scientific and philosophic perspective, what is your answer to those others of you, predominantly Mr. Um, Klinghoffer and Ms. O'Leary, who have presented the other reason why Darwinism continues to be accepted, namely the existential need for it, and if I may also say the spiritual uh, presence of this god of the Baal Peor, which you also acknowledge is there. I don't think there's any contradiction. Just that, it just that in, in, in my own writing and Denise's writing, that we, that we may give more emphasis to that, because that's that's sort of the background we come from, and and it's 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 our tr that we're trained in that more than perhaps in, on the scientific side, but it's not it's not there are two competing truths here, or two it's it's two different ways of looking at the same question, and what I try to do is explain to people why. The scientific question matters. So a lot of people will say, "Well, you know, it's just science. It's, it's what has it got to do with me?" Truth is, it has it has something very intimately to do with each one of us, and we're and and we can understand that, that to the extent that we're honest with ourselves. And many people are not honest with themselves, and that's why I think a lot of people are not. It's it's. We had a questioner who we had a couple of questioners who I th who didn't seem to. Have perceive what we were actually saying. We're responding not to what we had said, but to cliches and stereotypes of what we say, no matter what, it almost seems like, no matter how much you try to explain the science to someone like that, they're going to say, so what you're saying is the Earth is only 5,000 years old? It's like you, they, they didn't hear you. So that's why I find it useful to say, let's think about it experientially, existentially, emotionally, psychologically, religiously, because sometimes people, people can hear that a little bit better than they can the science. And I think there are some com areas of common ground. And I, uh, to pique your interest, next year, Illustra Media's next video is called Metamorphosis. And it deals with butterflies. And that is an area of science, but it's also a staggering area of beauty. 
And I do think that on our side, yes, there's the, the ball of Peor, the, the, there's the other things, that the, the lower angels of our nature that pull us in one direction, but there's also the craving for beauty and, and really thinking that beauty is real. It's not just the effluvium of our survival of the fittest or sexual selection as Darwin tried to make it out, but that there's something really there that's transcendent. Uh, people want to feel valued. They want to feel loved, that they're not just the product of an impersonal process. So I think that there are a lot of really deep, need that this ties into. And this sort of is one reason why, uh, let's, let's be honest and forthright, the reason why people are debating these things is because they do raise larger worldview implications. Now, I don't think that dismisses the idea that you can make focus on the science, as in fact a lot of our scholars do. But we've always been very honest and forthright, and I mean there's a reason that Richard Dawkins writes books like The God Delusion. It's because these scientific and empirical questions are connected to larger questions of, of our view of the world and our significance in it. And so I do think that there are ways of reaching people about significance and beauty and, and things that are much more consonant in a, in a design framework than they are in a Darwinian framework. I mean, if you think, just to leave you on this, uh, Michael Ruse and E.O. Wilson writing a few years ago, and this is a perennial problem with, of Darwinian ethicists. Well, how do you explain people like Mother Teresa? Well, you end up, they often come down and trying to show how, in a Darwinian view, she really is selfish, or that she was selfish, and you try to re-explain what our common sense would tell us. No, there are these people of, of great love and of great self-sacrifice, and that's a noble thing. But in a Darwinian framework, you really have to debase that. And I think most people realize there's something dehumanizing about that, something really that, that dries us out and shrivels us up, and that, so there is the attraction for meaning and significance that I think, and beauty, that I think those of us who subscribe to intelligent design need to be sure that that is brought out. And I think you'll see in the next few years, uh, one book that sort of approaches some of this is A Meaningful World by Jonathan Witt and Benjamin Weicker, that were two Discovery Institute fellows that I would encourage you to, you know, read. Oh, I just wanted to say a word about Mother Teresa because her name came up. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm still thinking about the cream corn that Craig mentioned this morning. <laughs> oh, um, no, you, you can have the cream corn. Uh, you can have my share. Um, uh, no, just this. Many people don't know because her, public, her personal papers were only recently published that she actually spent most of her life struggling against serious depression. Yet she persisted, yet she did all those things. Um, I, I think that if she's ever made a patron saint, she should be one of the patron saints of people with depression. What had happened was she had had some very real spiritual experiences in the late 40s, in which um, she says Jesus spoke to her and his mother spoke to her and said, don't you see how these people are suffering? And here you are teaching in a girls' school. Um, couldn't you go and do something? And she said, well, no, I can't. And they said, well, we'll help you. Um, and so the rest of the story you know. But I just mentioned that because if ever there was a person who would have created even greater problems for doctors Roos and Wilson, then Mother Teresa, I can't think of one. She actually got nothing out of it personally, except we must assume she is with God now. Well, if you enjoyed this, I think some of you need to consider our Master of Arts degree in Science and Religion. <laughs> All right, there, we paid for the event, yes. Uh, join me in thanking our wonderful panelists, some of whom traveled a long way. And one more, one more big thank you to Discovery Institute for sponsoring this event and providing the free books. We're just so grateful, so thank you. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.